Good afternoon. I think it will be very difficult to follow Sarah's absolutely fantastic talk. So thank you very much to the organizers and the PSC Foundation for inviting me to speak at this absolutely amazing event. It has given me a delightful opportunity to read about Trevor Pierce's uh, work, his life, his legacy. So in my talk, I will just be able to give you a glimpse on how we are hunting far away galaxies, not only with depending on advanced computing and engineering, but also driving those advances. I will have a quick glance into the past, the present and the future. So let me start with a beautiful CYRAC, an amazing computer designed and built by Trevor Piercy and his team. It reminded me of a visit a few years ago to the Deutsche Museum, where I was able to see a replica of Zuse Z3 built by Konrad Zuse in 1941, an electromagnetic computer. Uh, so the, the CYRAC electronic computer is a much, much advanced uh, computer. What I find very, very interesting before CYRAC, there were the human computers, mostly women, mathematicians, programmers who were doing all the calculations. Uh, this picture here shows the ENIAC programmers. There's even a movie about the ENIAC 7. So I wonder who they were at CYRAC, what their story is. I haven't found anything in the literature about that. Overall, advances in computing, absolutely essential for astronomy and, and all sciences, really at the same time, astronomy in this case also drives those computing. And I could add engineering to this to make it a triangle of essential collaborations, working together, which was also a theme that Trevor Piercy, I think, propagated throughout his life. So let me start here in the past. Uh, this little telescope on the left here, is the first telescope I used. I had it to myself often as a student, uh, in this case, looking at our galaxy, the Milky Way. The telescope was tuned to the 21 centimeter line of atomic hydrogen. So I was mapping hydrogen throughout the Milky Way. At the same time, this massive telescope in the middle, the 100 meter Effelsberg telescope already existed. But the students had to first learn on the little telescope, before being able to uh, talk to the operators on the big Effelsberg telescope. So soon after, I migrated to work on an even larger telescope, a radio interferometer, one of the biggest in the world, the very large array consisting of 27, 25 meter telescopes, spanning a diameter of about 40 kilometers. So these kind of telescopes use Earth's rotation to build to create through Earth's rotation a 40 kilometer diameter telescope. Now that gives you amazing resolution and that's important to us. When I was working at the Stockard telescope, we still had chart recorders. So I probably have one of those rolls somewhere. But soon after, we wrote things on magnetic tapes. And I brought a little treasure box along. Maybe I should put it up here. I still have one of those tapes. <laughs> I doubt I can still read the contents of that. So. Nevertheless, these three telescopes still exist. The Stoggart telescope is still used for teaching. Effelsberg is still a cutting edge world-class telescope, just recently been upgraded with a phased array feed that was built for ASCAP, the Australian SKA Pathfinder, more about that later. So we built this feed, they bought it from us, installed it on their telescope for most recent work. And the VLA is being expanded into the EVLA and soon the NG, the next generation VLA. Now the VLA was interesting because it's a radio interferometer and that really, really good, got me hooked on radio interferometry. The colorful picture at the right there is a hydrogen map of the first galaxy I observed with that array. So uh, then in Australia, I came here really to work with the Australia Telescope Compact Array, somewhat smaller with six 22 meter dishes on an Eastway railway track, but spanning a frequency range from one to 100 gigahertz, allowing you to not only observe atomic hydrogen, but also carbon monoxide, tracing the molecular hydrogen gas. And how did we store our data there? Well, let me have a look. Exabytes, hundreds of them. <coughs> Once we didn't have that many more CD rooms, and it was delightful later to move to DLTs because each of them held probably, I don't know, a hundred of the CD rooms. So 
now those data are all sitting on my laptop in my bag then you know easy to analyze but then that was much harder so these computing advances have been absolutely essential for progress in astronomy um, I guess it's always dangerous to put the pictures up from a few people. There have been so many amazing pioneers and, and legends, uh, but associated with these two telescopes, I just wanted to put up here pictures of Bob Freiter, Ron Ickes, who's in the audience, John Brooks, uh, Paul Wilde, and Joe Posey. So when we observed with the Parkes telescope, um, we had just created, for the purpose of making an all-sky survey, this massive receiver up there. Until then, uh, receivers often consisted of a single large horn. It's so large because it's looking for 21 centimeter radiation. But a group of people got together and saying, why just one? Should we have two, three, seven, 13? The engineers initially said, you're a greedy lot. You want more every time, but next day, yeah, I think we can do 13. The system weighs about a ton, but essentially allows us to do sky surveys 13 times faster than we could have done with a single horn. So the movie that you see uh, playing here is just a small fraction of the sky. When it gets very, very busy, we're in the middle of our galaxies, the hydrogen in the Milky Way. And beyond that, we see a, a band stretching between the Milky Way and the Magellanic Cloud, the so-called Magellanic Stream. And when you see only individual blobs, we're seeing individual galaxies nearby in the sculptor group. So each of these planes here is, is a different velocity, a different frequency. And what that means uh, for astronomy is actually we're looking at objects further and further away. At the same time, we're looking into the past. This light left a long, long time ago to reach us now. Uh, the 5,000 galaxies that we cataloged in that particular survey are just shown here in, a diff in an animation. Blue are the nearby galaxies, that are the far away ones, and the size of the blobs essentially shows how massive they are. Now, the multi-beam system that we built for the Parkes telescope really changed, changed the field enormously. People came knocking on the door and said, we want one of those as well. So we built a seven beam system for the beautiful Arecibo telescope. Addition Puerto Rico is sitting in the valley, 300 meters in diameter. Uh, just last year, their catalog of galaxies was published about 30,000 galaxies. But even though these telescopes are very, very large, we can't see much more than just a blob of each of these galaxies. So how do we get to see more detail? Well, the biggest telescope right now, the biggest single telescope is in China, the 500 meter Chinese telescope FAST. And uh, last year we delivered them a 19 beam receiver to be able to do very, very large sky surveys, both for galaxies as well also for pulsars. And on the right, you see again the picture of how the face away feed from ASCA is lifted up to parks which also gave Parks the status of an SKA precursor, they were having introduced SKA. And then at the bottom there, the face to feed on the secondary mirror of the Effelsberg telescope. It, it just shrinks in size there because that mirror is so big. Uh, in future, we already have a, a design, a small one of a rocket face to feed that promises to be even better in terms of its sensitivity than the checkerboard feed that you see there and that I'll show a little bit more about later. Uh, so we're looking again for collaboration and funding to proceed with that. I think this never stops. So how do these blobs actually look like? Each of them being a galaxy doesn't tell you very much until I show you a picture like this, namely going from the Parkes telescope now to the compact ray having a diameter telescope of six kilometer diameter, I can look at much more detail. So each of these galaxies were a separate observation, each about 30 hours long to make this kind of picture. What you see is a neutral hydrogen gas, the red parts being the high intensity areas, the blue, the lower intensity areas. So all kinds of shapes. You see a zoo of galaxies here, small, large, regular, irregular, and that's not the only thing I get. I also get the velocity fields. Now from these velocity fields, blue is the part coming towards you, red is the part going away from you. I can measure the rotation curve of each galaxy. That in turn 
let me calculate the total mass of each galaxy, and from that I can deduce the amount of dark matter in each of these galaxies. Now, dark matter is really embarrassing. We still don't know what it is. We've been searching for such a long time. If physics is right as we know it on Earth and our kind of solar system, then there must be so much dark matter there and, and we just don't know what it is. So we keep searching or we keep changing physics to make some adjustments, but you know, that's a little bit dangerous as well. So there's still a lot to be learned there. Now, I wanted to show you also an optical image of a galaxy because you're much more used to maybe looking at beautiful images from the Hubble Space Telescope. This is one of my favorite galaxies, Messier 83. You see the stars here, but you also see dust dust within the spiral arms and the pink areas are where new stars have formed. Those are the youngest stars. The yellow areas are the older stars. The pink areas are the, the new stars. Now that's the galaxy as seen in neutral hydrogen and when you look at the comparison often the stellar disk, the optical images, we can only see the inner part of the galaxies. In hydrogen they tend to be two, three times bigger than what you see in the stars. If you could see that galaxy with your 21 centimeter glasses, you know, on the sky, it would be twice the size of the moon. It is a really massive galaxy. And then if I put the optical and the radio images together, this is a picture my postdoc Angel Lopez Sanchez made a few years ago. You get this beautiful view of, of Messier 83. And I can also make a 3D animation, which gives you a chance that in reality you don't have, only in my computer simulation, to see this galaxy at different angles in 3D. Okay, that brings me to the Australia Telescope, uh, Australian SKA Pathfinder, which Sarah already talked about, out in the Bullardi in uh, Merchinson Shire, far away from people, mobile phones, microwave, ovens, so that it's as radio quiet as possible. The telescopes are also distributed over six kilometers. So using Earth rotation again, I can have a very, very big telescope making very, very sharp images. But that's not all it can do. Uh, this is equipped with phased array feeds, each of them forming 36 beams on the sky. Each beam is about a degree in size, so together, observing in one pointing 30 square degrees on the sky. And that's what's making OSCAP a fast survey machine. Similarly, like the multi-beam on parks, speeding up surveys, now we have a very fast telescope that can also make very, very sharp images. Now the data rate already from this image, uh, from this telescope is absolutely enormous. It's much smaller than what the SKA will deliver, but it is already a challenge for us to process these data. 72 terabits per second, storage of 500 petabytes per year. Those are, those are amazing numbers. Now let's come to the heart of the array. The heart is the checkerboard phased array feed that you see here. It really looks a bit like a chessboard with 188 receptors uh, weighted in different ways to get the 36 beams. Now the inside of that um, beautiful phased array feed looks like that. I couldn't bring it along, it's too big. But I brought along one of the 3,600 dominoes. You can see them there. There's about 100 in each of the phased array feeds. And I can take this apart and show you the inside, but I might do that over coffee or wine later on. It's going to be a bit too messy. Uh, so there are many, many components that went into building these phased array feeds, 36 of them, and then getting them all to work together. And you know what? This is happening right now. Uh, last week, this week, we are just getting all 36 telescopes working together, forming 36 beams. It's hard work. We've been going over many, many years, combining six antennas, 12 antennas, 18 antennas, we are now this week at 36, and we are at the doorsteps of able to start the big surveys. What has been absolutely crucial in this adventure in building OSCAP is a collaboration with industry. So just two of them mentioned here, but this is a continuous collaboration and linkage that, that we all benefit from and that we enjoy 
embedding people in industry and vice versa, working together nationally and internationally. Now here again, a little bit uh, of, of what we have actually done. The kind of orange colored field that you see there is 30 square degrees on the sky, observed by my team uh, a few months ago, where there is hundreds of galaxies in there. So one of our challenges actually is finding the galaxies within the noise. The bright ones are always easy to find, but the faint ones that are just sticking out above the noise are very, very difficult to find. So ultimately for the survey that I lead, we will have a thousand such pointings, each with about 500 galaxies in it that we, it's like needles in a haystack that we need to find. So we're writing software to do this. And so 500,000 galaxies is what we expect to find at the end of this adventure. All the data are made public. That means not just I and my team benefit from that, Every one of you could download a chunk of the data or people around the world who are working in the field are very much invited to do that. Now I want to tell you that not only do we observe galaxies or find galaxies, those white lines, those contours show you where the hydrogen is and there is white contours around that galaxy, but there are two big blobs above that galaxy where we just find hydrogen clouds. No stars have formed there yet. So there's this hydrogen reservoir sitting there, cold gas, which is a fuel for star formation. It's sitting there until maybe a collision happens, something happens to ignite star formation. This is still something we're studying, we're not fully understanding what we know. These massive reservoirs of gas are there and stars will be able to form there, but how that actually works, we're trying to find out. In fact, this picture doesn't show all of the gas. I know from Park's observations that there is even more gas there than I have seen with ASCAP because an interferometer is also a filter. It doesn't see all scales. The antennas can only be moved that close together and there is a gap and the Park's telescope fills that beautifully. Right, I'm coming to the end. We have seen uh, hunting with gal galaxies with ASCAP is, is exciting, I hope ultimately for all of us to be able to have you know, a million galaxies to work with or even more. SOFIA is our source finding application that is absolutely essential to find all these galaxies. The array is close to being ready. The computing is still being enhanced every day. You know, now looking to moving from CPUs to GPUs for better computing power and who knows what the future brings there. We'll soon hear about quantum computing, uh, many areas uh, that, that will be advanced. At the same time, we're trying to stay green. We'd like to be able to power our telescope by alternative energies such as solar energy and geothermal energy, and also our supercomputer. We'd like to be able to power it in, in, in a reliable, in a sustainable manner. Uh, and at this stage, I also like to acknowledge the Wadiriyama tea on whose land the observatory is built. So very, very quick glimpse in the future. You will hear a lot about ASCAP uh, results coming out, hopefully also surprises, things we, we didn't know about before. Uh, you will hear a lot about Meerkat, a telescope in South Africa that has just been opened a few months ago. It's now uh, getting um, its first uh, data. And Meerkat is the instrument that will morph into the square kilometer array phase one uh, that Sarah talked about. We will also hear a lot about LAGO, black holes merging, merging and, and sending out gravitational waves. That's a whole new field of, of science. And computing, I love that one of the supercomputers at CSRO is named after PSC here, you see it in the picture. Quantum computing, artificial intelligence, DNA storage and the space data highway will all be things that have more already happening and will affect us. So none of this can happen without dedicated people. Uh, the pictures here just show a few people in, in my international team, uh, dedicated people working together, international cross-disciplinary teams are absolutely essential for this. So thank you very much.